Good morning, my name is Richard Burley. I work at the Industrial Decarbonisation Group at the Materials Processing Institute. My work focuses on industrial decarbonisation, fuel and energy switching, SME development, prototype design development, testing and installation. Steel production globally. New steel produces approximately 1.35 billion tonnes per year. Recycled steel is approximately 0.45 billion tonnes per year, amounting to 1.8 billion tonnes per year of steel produced. Steel is potentially 100% recyclable, and the steel industry produces approximately 7 to 9% of the global CO2 emissions, with an average of 1.7 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel. That figure is slightly flexible, dependent upon where you go for your information. Emissions from an EAF can be as low as 0.4 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per tonne of hot metal. And the total EAF route accounts for 29% of global steel production. Predicted steel and emissions constraints. So million tonnes of CO2 produced, approximately 2,800 million tonnes of CO2 is produced yeah, as of 2015. As of 2050, that needs to be reduced to 400 to 600 million tonnes of CO2. If we look at how much steel we actually produce, currently we produce 1,600 million tonnes, or one, now 1,800 million tonnes. By 2050, that's anticipated to be as high as 2,500 million tonnes. This would give us an equated CO2 reduction required of approximately 90% compared to 2015 figures. Therefore, to form part of the emissions reduction strategy, DRI and EAF route will be integral. Emissions factors for steel production. If we look at the blast furnace and the basic oxygen furnace route, then we can see that equates to approximately two tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel produced. If we go down the DRI EAF route using coal, then we actually increase our tonnes of CO2 per tonne of hot metal to 2.4. However, once we switch to natural gas DRI, then that drops to 1.4 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of hot metal. And if we use scrap EAF and only electricity, then that drops further down to 0.4 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of hot metal, giving us the global average of 1.7 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of hot metal. Energy demands for an EAF per tonne of hot metal. In the middle, we can see the basic oxygen furnace and in green, we can see the electric arc furnaces we can see that the actual requirements are 2.25 gigajoules per tonne of hot metal. This can possibly be reduced down to a practical minimum of 1.6 gigajoules per tonne of hot metal, with a theoretical minimum of 1.3 gigajoules per tonne of hot metal. Now, the steel industry has reduced energy consumption by over 50% in the last 30 years. However, more low-lying hanging fruit are more difficult to come by. Therefore, a move to more EAS steel production will lead to a greater dependency of electricity as a primary energy source as we use this to reduce CO2 emissions. Electricity is more expensive than gas or coal as an energy source, and the guaranteed consistent supply would be required to run EAF. With 29% of global steel from EAF, that equates to 1.17 ectojoules per year using the actual requirements from the table shown to the left. An EAF operation then, emissions from the EAF are mainly indirect, coming from the electricity supply and the production of gas and oxyfuels for chemical heating. Although there are direct emissions from the carbon electrodes, equating to between one and five kilograms per tonne of hot metal, oxidation of carbon in the feedstock, and some carbon for carburization. 
As mentioned before, 29% of the global steel is produced in EEF, which equates to 0.52 billion tonnes of steel per year. And the energy required, therefore, is 1.17 exojoules per year. Therefore, a 300 tonne electric arc furnace requires approximately 132 megawatt hours to melt its load in 37 minutes. Where insufficient scrap is available, high quality steel is required from a DRI. High quality feed is required for the steel in a DRI. Electricity from renewable sources can reduce the carbon footprint of the supply. The cost of renewable electricity is more expensive than from fossil fuels. If we deploy energy storage systems, then we can buffer the electricity supply. There are many types of energy storage, kinetic, heat, dynamic, pneumatic, hydraulic, gas, pumped storage and chemical. We will focus on chemical energy storage as a supply of electrical energy for operating ES. Shown is a simplified schematic process for energy storage, where the electrical energy is provided from solar and wind and from the grid AC. This is fed through a DC bus bar and into the battery storage. This energy can then be used to run a DC EAF and an AC EAF by converting back to AC. The energy management system controls and manages all of the in and outputs from the bus bar and the battery storage to maintain distribution. We've selected five large scale battery storage systems, lithium ion, sodium sulfur, flow batteries, lead acid and nickel chloride. The yellow portion shows the available energy required in percentage. Lithium iron at 85%, sodium sulfur at 75%, flow at 67, lead acid at 89, and the nickel chloride at 85. On initial inspection, this would indicate the flow battery is the worst performing of these five. Now let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of battery storage systems. The lithium ion has energy densities of 400 watt hours per litre. High levels of efficiency, able to maintain large numbers of charge and discharge cycles. They do have high costs. They can be damaged by overcharging and heavy discharging, and they are prone to overheat. The sodium sulfur has high energy density, fast response when stored and heated, high efficiency for charge discharge cycles, high durability under charge discharge. They may require heating to maintain their charge and high heat may cause fire potentials. Lead acid is a well-established technology with robust disposal networks. They have good efficiency and discharge rates of only 3%. They can suffer damage under heavy discharge. They have low energy density and they contain hazardous materials. Flow batteries are stable under heavy discharge regime high tolerance to large numbers of charge and discharge cycles. They're not susceptible to being downgraded due to single cell degradation. But subject to space availability, they are potentially unlimited capacity. Several liquid types are in development and vanadium flow battery uses highly ionized vanadium. Energy density is low. Established technology, but recent chemistry additions make maturity less well known and the size of the electrolyte tanks. Nickel chloride has advantages of energy density is high, no discharge or losses, 20 year life, no cooling required, all materials are recyclable. They may require heating before use, long cycle only, and they are, do contain many toxic compounds. When we look at the energy and power response levels, we can see that the flow battery actually operates at very low power quality and fast response levels and has storage up to week long, operating the greatest range for energy and power requirements. The principal operation of a V-flow battery 
is that vanadium flow batteries are containerized systems where the storage capacity can be increased by simply using larger containers of electrolyte. For vehicle-borne, this is not that useful, but for land-borne industry, this may well provide an ideal opportunity. The electrolyte is non-flammable. The electrical current is generated and stored in electron valences of the V2 and V3 ions. The energy is released from the movement of electrons from the V4 and V5 ions. Hydrogen is passed through the ionic membrane. New membrane types are being developed for redox flow batteries. Light oxide graphine, graphene, highly oxidized graphene and bacterial cellulose nanofibers. The standard type in use at the moment is Nathion 212. We can see that at different electrolyte concentrations, the different membranes perform in different ways with the HGO and BC performing best compared to the standard technologies of Nafion 212 and by using low concentrations of electrolyte. The membrane allows transfer of potassium and hydroxide, hydroxides through and the new membrane technology allows the flow of ions more readily within V-flow batteries, including the electroconductivity. Focusing on one particular company then for what dual, dual V-flow batteries. Their technology advancement of vanadium flow batteries, batteries are able to operate at larger ranges of temperatures, efficiencies are increased, making them more desirable as a storage option, and their costs per kilowatt hour are dropping. If we look at the 2021 figures for the Gen 2 batteries, we can see that the electrolyte energy density has increased to 50 watt hours per litre. They have a greater operating chain range from minus 40 to plus 70 degrees C. The DC round efficiency is 85 to 92 percent. And we can see that their DC system capital costs have dropped down to $150 per kilowatt hour. These are anticipated to increase efficiency and drop costs further by 2024. Distribution of battery systems globally then, the largest system currently being manufactured is in Florida at 409 megawatts, producing 900 megawatt hours of battery storage. Most systems are rated on the four hour storage system. In the UK, there is 13. 5 gigawatts of battery storage with a further 1.3 gigawatts ready to deploy and a further 12.2 gigawatts in planning or in the proposal stages. The Intergen Gateway will become the largest single storage system in the world at 1.3 gigawatt hours, which is due to start construction in 2022 using lithium ion battery storage. A proposed further site of 350 megawatt hours is also in planning for its folding. These systems will be used against domestic loading and power balancing with peak load frequency stabilization. None of these systems as yet are deployed for industrial purposes. If we look at the levelized cost, we can see that the vanadium flow battery performs relatively well at 467 euros per kilowatt hour, with lithium iron at 795, sodium sulfur at 298, which is the best performing on cost basis, and the lead acid at 618. To reduce emissions then from the steel making, some facilities can adopt electric steel making. There are several energy storage systems that could be employed to store energy for conversion to electricity and consequently used for power, powering electricity steel making. Battery storage would involve less conversion steps and reduce for the need for energy losses during conversion compared to many of the man, mechanical systems. Many systems of battery storage are available with systems involving lithium iron, lead acid, flow, sodium sulfur and nickel chloride systems. The flow battery does offer 
the best fast response times, power durability, adaptability for increased power and longer life with no cell degradation. Thank you very much for allowing me to present today and we I think we have time for some questions. <laughs>